ago that I'm going to be preaching about gifts, and I've done so the last few weeks. <coughs> the first week, Cass and uh, Mark and them told me, Amy, I'm still finding pieces of glass in the floor. So uh, if you're barefooted this morning, you may want to uh, be careful in this area right here. We've swept the floor several times. The first uh, message I taught about, I preached about the alabaster box and the greatest gift that we can give anybody in our life is to wholly sell ourselves out yes. to Jesus and to pour ourselves out to him and to give ourselves wholly to him because that is the greatest gift we could ever give anybody in our life is to solely, is to wholly, 100% sell ourselves out to the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, I talked about the ordinary gift, how everyday life is a gift Amen. That we take advantage of and we take for granted. But everyday life is a miracle. Amen. And that there's things that happen in an ordinary everyday life that is changing. It's life changing. There's a miracle that happens every day in an ordinary life that is absolutely amazing. And this week, this is the week before Christmas. We're going to label this our Christmas uh, service because how many of you know Sunday is Christmas? And a lot of people get mad when you don't have church on Christmas Sunday, but I believe that church uh, is a family and that you need to spend Christmas with your family. Amen. And so you don't need to be in the church house Christmas. You need to be with your family on Christmas. And so we won't have service actually Christmas Day. Uh, this will be our Christmas sermon and our Christmas service. As you can see, we got all these gifts here that we're fixing to bless a family with uh, that I'm pretty excited about. But today's sermon... I'm going to still continue out of the book of Ruth, and I want to preach about the kinsman redeemer. I made mention of that last week in last week's message about Boaz being the kinsman redeemer. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. To be redeemed, you guys know what to be redeemed means. It's simple. It's to be set free by paying a price when you redeem something. You have paid a price for that thing, and you have. So let's say I've got a 12 gauge shotgun, and I take it down to the pawn shop, and they give me $150 to hold that thing because I need a loan, right? And so I take my 12 gauge down. Tell me why you laughing. Have you done that before? <laughs> you ain't got a purse that big. She ain't got a purse that big for 12 gauge. So you take it down to the pawn shop, right? And they give you $150, $200 for it. You hop that thing. So you need that thing back. So you, you're ready to pay your money back. So in order to redeem that shotgun, yeah. I like your hair good. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you, man. Thank you. Spiky. Thank you, man. <laughs> so in order to redeem that shotgun back, what do you got to do? You got to pay the price. Right, right. Yep. So you go back, you pay the price, and you get that 12 gauge back. That's what happens, right? Same thing if it was a toolbox or whatever it is. You you hawk it. You you know, you, 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 you bring it to me, and you say, Amy, I'm needing a little bit of money. You know, and then I don't trust the pawn shop, so if you'll let me borrow $20, you know, I'll give you my dirty sock. <laughs> give me the dirty sock, and then I charge you $35 to get the dirty sock back. Now, that's never going to happen. I'm just using that as an illustration. You know, my wife would be like, you know, Amy, we need to talk about our finances. And, you know, if you let people borrow $20 for a dirty sock, they ain't never coming back to get that sock paper. You just give them $20, right? We need to talk about some redemption because you fist in the need redeemed. Right? Redemption is is a reversal of a bad situation. Amen. It's like if you're in a lost cause. How many of you have ever been in a lost cause? You've been in a dead-end spot. You have been in a dead-end. Um, yeah. And somebody has come and redeemed you. How many of you have been on the side of a road and you've got that blowout tire? Yeah. Teresa called me one time. She was on her way to North Carolina. And she is somewhere in Tennessee. Don't ever ask my wife where she's at because she's going to be like, well, there's some trees, and I think I passed a sign, and I am on a road. <laughs> she's never going to know where she's at. Microsoft help direction. And so it's, it's hard to find her. i got to keep a GPS on her so I can know where exactly she's at. So the new vehicle, and because I have an iPhone, it will tell me exactly where the vehicle's located, even if it's in a parking lot. Thank God I can find my wife now. So... She was in a bad situation because she had a flat tire, and here she was in the mountains of Tennessee, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and she was in to have this flat tire. So she she needed redemption.
redemption. Somebody needed to redeem her. They needed to fix this situation to get her off the side of this road. She was in a dead end. She was in a bad spot. She was in a lost cause. She wasn't going anywhere. So do y'all see that what redeem and what redemption means, right? So let's in, in this story of Ruth and Naomi, we find that Naomi is in need of a redeemer. Do you remember me talking about her story? There were several reasons why she was in need of a redeemer. Number one, she was a widow. Remember, her husband died. After yeah. they moved, her husband died, right? So she was a widow, which means, guess what? She didn't have nothing anymore. She was to rely on her sons. Well, guess what? Both of her sons died. Now she's really in a lot of trouble because now she has no husband. She has no kids. And she now has the land that her husband had that was to go to her sons, now that she cannot possess, has a debt against it. And she cannot pay that debt. And so she's in this really bad situation. Well, at the time of, is in the time of, of, of this time frame in Israel, you can't buy and sell land. This is all God's property, God's land. It's inherited. It's only inherited through family. I can't just go and say, hey, I want to sell you a piece of my property. No, it's all related to blood and inheritance and family and land. You can't buy and sell. It's got to be passed down heritage and bloodlines, right? So it's not like she could be like, oh, well, I'm just going to sell this property and live off of what I make off of it. She could not do that, right? So that's another problem that she was having. The land could only be leased. There's a, there's a few things that she could do with it. But guess what? She was a woman. She couldn't even do that. The man could do it. The man could have leased his property. You know, the, the man could encumber his property. But she couldn't because she was a woman. She's not allowed to conduct business. So she was in a bad spot. She was in a dead end. She was at a lost cause. She needed to be redeemed in this situation. She was in need of a redeemer. So, there was a question. Who can redeem her? Not, in, not just anybody could, right? So, when she came back into town, Rhonda, you know, she was staying in this place over here, and her little neighbor fella. Winked at her, thought she was cute. Mm. Oh, I'll take care of you. How many of you got people like that? Mm -hmm. oh, I got you. I'll take care of you. Well, you know, it didn't work like that neither. Nope. The, there, there had to be qualifications in order to redeem somebody's property. The first qualification was, number one, it had to be the nearest relative. And it was actually a responsibility of the nearest relative. They had to. They didn't have an option. There was only one way out. These were the two ways out. Number one, you had to be close enough bloodline to qualify as family. Okay? You had to prove that you was pure bloodline. So I had to prove I was close enough bloodline to Rhonda to redeem this property from her. That's the number one qualification. If my bloodline to her wasn't pure, I did not qualify. That was number one qualification. Number two qualification, look at this, guys. I had to have the means not only to pay the debt, I had to have the means to make sure I could secure it forever. <coughs> mm -hmm. I'm not talking about just paying it off. Oh, yeah, well, I'll pay this off, and in a couple of years, I'll pass it on. No, if you paid it off, you had to make sure you could secure this thing forever. It could stay in your bloodline forever. In other words, you had to make sure you had enough kids and your wealth was enough to pass down to their wealth and your lineage was strong enough to handle whatever you was fixing to redeem. Right. Amen. So if I was a man and I had three kids and I was barely scraping by... I didn't qualify because my bloodline and my wealth was not strong enough to secure something forever. Now, you know, if it was a chicken, we could probably handle that. Yeah. You know, but if it was hundreds of acres of developed property, you see what I'm saying? You see where I'm going with this? Yep. 
So somebody had to qualify to be this redeemer. It couldn't just be just anybody. So here Naomi is, she's in need of a redeemer, and it just couldn't be just your average Joe putting on a show, acting like he's somebody that's got something, wanting something for free. You know, you always got them people coming by wanting something from you for free. Mm -hmm. Wanting something for cheap. Wanting something for nothing. <coughs> wanting a wheel and deal. Oh, well, she in a, she in a bind. I bet I can get this for a little bit of nothing. That is not how Israel worked at that time. Nope. I think some of us may need to kind of pick our standards up just a little bit. Maybe we need to pull some of Israel's blood back into us just a little bit. So maybe, maybe we need to value some of our stuff. Maybe a little bit more like Israel did. Just a little bit. Think about that. That's a sermon for another day. What, the, what our value is. Anyway, we're moving on. So, he had to have the close bloodline. Now, Boaz comes along. Boaz was actually family to Naomi. He was not the closest family to Naomi. Somebody else was closer. So Boaz congregates together this group of family, and he sets them all down, and he says, we need to have a meeting about who's going to redeem this property. And the one that qualified that was the closest in the bloodline that could redeem the property, he says, oh, yeah, that's a very nice piece of property. I think I'll take that. And he says, well, you know, the whole package comes with it. It means you got to take the women too. No, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on, huh? Huh? Um, I don't think I can do it. Hmm. <laughs> he quickly changes his mind. And he backs out. And at that time, you would take your sandal off. This is the baton. I'm not going to take my shoe off. <laughs> but the baton was they would take their sandal off and they would pass it to the next, next in line. And so he took his sandal off and he passed it on to Boaz and he said, Sir, if you want it, it's yours. And so Boaz, like I said, was a man of integrity, a man of kindness. He was he had very, had very much wealth. Boaz ended up redeeming Naomi's property. Amen. Because what Boaz realized was Naomi's husband had died which left all of the property to Naomi's son. So he wasn't marrying Naomi. He was marrying who? The son's wife. Ruth. Mm -hmm. So Boaz marries Ruth, but it, he, he redeemed Naomi and Ruth. Amen. Amen. So... Boaz become the kinsman redeemer and he redeemed all of the property. Amen. This was set up and established by God for a reason. There was a reason. I told you, right in the middle of all the chaos that's going on in the Bible, there's this book of ordinary everyday life that just doesn't make sense. There's no miracles. There's no jumping up and down. There's no killing. There's no, it's, and it's only like 85 verses. There's only a couple of chapters and it's just sandwiched in there. There's a reason. There's a purpose. That there's a reflection here I'm fixing to show you guys. This is the only example in the Bible where a kinsman redeemer is illustrated. The only example in the Bible where a kinsman redeemer is illustrated of how it worked. Let me show you something. Boaz had this they use this Hebrew word, and I may not pronounce it right, but I'm from Alabama, and we're not going to even judge me for that. We're going to call it Hest. If it's not right, Cass can correct me later. We'll have an education <laughs> class from my English major in the back of the room at a later date. We have these meetings often. Not necessarily about English, but he does correct me at times. He corrected me on a text message the other day, and I had to laugh real hard because what I meant to say come out really wrong, and it was really funny, uh, almost embarrassing. But anyway, we're going to call this Hest. It's a Hebrew word that's used in the book of Ruth about Boaz. His, he, 
his affection towards Ruth, his character, who he was. And there's no English equivalent to this word. We do not, we cannot say a word that's equivalent to this word. We can combobulate and we can group words together to form a meaning, but we have no word that can mean this word, Gail. These are some of the groupings that we can put together that means this word has. Unfailing love. <coughs> loving kindness. Eternal, limited, or limitless, faithful love. Amen. Look at this bottom. A complete, un a complete, undeserved kindness and generosity. That's what Hest means. That's a lot of English words for one word. Yeah. That's almost like that's almost like we don't understand this. Yep. Right? This is this was Boaz's character. When he seen Ruth, this is what he poured out on her. Hest. Hest. That's what we're on. Hest. Okay. Everybody say that just so I know y'all from Alabama. Yes. There you go. I don't know. It looks like Hess head to me. Whatever. Whatever it is. That's what it is. Right there. Yeah. Amen. What I find really important is there's very there's very similar meaning with this word found in Ruth that's found in John 3.16 where it says, For God so loved. Amen. 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 Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? The same kind of love. For God so loved. For God so, we'll say, hissed. This compassion, this complete kindness, this generosity, this Unfailing, this un, this unlimited edition, or, or limited edition, unlimited edition, this limitless love. We can't even wrap our minds around. The Bible says our minds can't even understand. We Amen. can't even start to begin to understand the love of God. It's so great. Amen. So I'm going somewhere with this. So when Adam fell in the garden, sin come upon man. And from at that point, God knew we needed a redeemer. He knew that we was going to need a redeemer. He knew that we was going to need somebody to pay a debt yep. that we could not pay. Cass, he knew we was going to get to a dead, end, a dead end road. He knew we was going to get to that place. That lost place. And that we was going to need to be saved. Amen. Yes. And rescued. Amen. He knew that. The moment Adam fell, he knew. The moment Adam fell, the plan began. He knew we was going to need... A redeemer. So on Christmas morning, as we celebrate it, very similar to the story of Ruth, here come Jesus born in the flesh, a baby. Not in the best of hospitals, Gail. Now this girl right here has drove me around Tyler Town, Texas, or Tyler Town, Texas, Tyler Town, Mississippi. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you, she showed me some of the places that this family's came from, some of the places this family was born in, hospitals. Jesus was not born in the best of the best. He was born in the most ordinary of places that you could even think. He was born by the most ordinary of people on the earth. A teenage girl and a not much older man that wasn't even married yet. So let's 
me break it down in today's terms. We got a pregnant teenager and a guy that ain't married her yet. A baby daddy. We got a pregnant teenager and a baby daddy. That's what today's world would call them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ordinary as ordinary gets. That's how God chose. Sounds kind of like the book of Ruth, right? Ordinary. Yeah. Ordinary life. Yep. And he was born, and you know he was raised by ordinary people. His daddy was a carpenter. They call him a carpenter. He was a craftsman. His mother taught him well, manners, respect. Taught him how to live. Taught him the basics of life. Must have taught him a lot of character. Must have taught him a lot of people skills. Because he grew up a phenomenal young man. Yes. Amen. Now yes, he was the son of God. But somebody raised the baby. Mm -hmm. yep. Somebody raised the baby. Yep. In an ordinary home. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that little boy got to get up, brush his teeth, comb his hair, put his clothes on whether he wanted to or not, right? Yep. <coughs> she wanted to know where my rags at. <laughs> ordinary life. He talked, he touched, he served ordinary people every day in his ministry. He didn't go to the fanciest of churches and stand before thousands of people and beg for their money and drive the fanciest cars, mm -hmm. make sure that he had on all the fancy jewelry. How do y'all like this $18 watch my wife bought me at Walmart? Y'all like this? And the reason she bought it is because she said, honey, leather don't go with everything. You need something, like, you need something <laughs> other than leather. <laughs> She's right. <laughs> Jesus didn't have to drive the most fanciest of things. I'm embarrassing her. I need to quit. <laughs> She's used to it. He didn't, he didn't ride a stallion. Most of the time it was a donkey if he rode anything. And I could only root, read one time where he rode a donkey. Yep. Yep. And then they like to beat him to death with palm branches. I'd have rather walk than have him do that. <laughs> they was waving him at him. They wasn't beating him. Yeah. <laughs> Yet. Ordinary life. He touched ordinary people. He didn't hang around the crowd and when they drank out of a cup they held their pinky up. <laughs> he, he hung around the crowd with the people missing the pinky. <laughs> that fell off with leprosy. Ordinary. He died to pay a debt that we could not pay. Amen. He is our Redeemer. He is our kinsman Redeemer. Amen. Just like Boaz was for Naomi and Ruth, this is a mere reflection. This is a prophetic illustration Amen. of what Jesus was going to be for us. Amen. <clears throat> yes. And you know what? The bloodline, let me give I'm gonna give y'all some scripture here in just a second. Goes on and on and on. Yeah. He qualified. You know there was two qualifications. Y'all remember the two qualifications? Number one, you had to make sure that bloodline was pure. Yes. Yep. Ephesians 1 and 7. I believe he was close enough in the bloodline. Because Ephesians 1 and 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgive our sins. His blood. Do you know that Mary was a virgin? She did not. There was no conception here. Right. He was the Son of God. The blood that flowed through his vein was nothing but that of the Father. Yes. Amen. Do you know that every ounce and fiber of your being, it doesn't matter who your mama and your daddy is, who your grandparents was, where you come from, what your ancestry is, where what nationality way back a hundred thousand years ago you came from, it doesn't matter. Do you know that every fiber of your being was created by the same Almighty God that fastened Jesus together in Mary's womb? And that you've got Amen. the same blood flowing through your veins Amen. that flowed through the blood, 
the things of Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you know that? I may be O positive, you may be O negative, you may be A, B, you may be A, you may be B, positive, negative, I don't care, I don't know, but I will tell you this, God created all of us out of the same thing. Amen. The dust of the earth is what he created us out of, and I'm going to tell you right now, we are all created the same. There's no more pure bloodline than that that came from Jesus, and it flows through every one of us. Amen. Uh, Yes. He qualifies yes. through the blood to be the Redeemer according to Ephesians 1 and 7. He purchased us through the blood. The second qualification is he has to be able to pay the debt forever. Mm. Hebrews 9 and 12 says, With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, because they tried to do that Come for on. years. Yep. Some of us try to use the blood of our billfolds. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of us try to use the blood of our kids. Ooh. Some of us try to use the blood of our time. Yep. Some of us try to use the blood of our talents. Some of us try to use the blood of anything we can get our hands on to buy our way in. Honey, I'm going to tell you what. The sacrifice you made to get to church this morning is no sacrifice worth bragging about. Amen. It's not going to get you to heaven. I, I promise I'm proud you're here. But honey, you walking through this door is not going to get you any closer to heaven if you don't bow your knee before an almighty God Amen. and claim that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior and that He died on the cross. Accept Him into your life and let the blood of Him flow through your veins. Yes. Amen. Coming to church is not going to save you. It's not going to help you. It will help you grow. It will help you mature. But your first step has got to be to realize He's the Son of God and let Him into your life and let Him make some changes on the inside of you. Amen. That's step number one. Yes. Amen. Goats and calves, the blood of goats and calves ain't going to save you. That's a sermon for another day. Amen. He entered the most holy place and there should be an end in there. Maybe you didn't correct me. <laughs> and, and once and for, that should be for, all time and secured our redemption for how long? Forever. 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 He paid for it forever. Amen. The debt has been paid forever. 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 He has redeemed us forever. Let me just tell you something. Naomi could have said, no, thank you. Ruth could have said, no, thank you. <coughs> she could have passed up the opportunity. She could have been a beggar. She could have let the land rot. How many of us do the same thing? We continue to live in our struggles. We continue to live in our failures. We continue to live in our worries. We continue to live with our problems. We continue to try every day. You know what? We struggle every day trying to fix something when God's trying to say, Honey, this ain't even your problem to fix. And you're wearing yourself out trying to fix something that I'm not even give you this thing to fix. And you're wearing yourself out fixing something that's not even yours to even be fixing. Yeah. Amen. Right? We do this. We do this. Jesus says, I've come to redeem you. Amen. I've come, what does that mean? I've come to set you free. Yeah. Amen. That doesn't just mean salvation. Salvation is step number one. Some of us need salvation. Some of us need set free from sin. But honey, some of us, Abby, need set free from bondage. Yep. Some of us yep. need set free from addiction. Some of us need set free from mental, mental disturbance. Some of us need set free from financial problems. Some of us need set free from relationships. Some of us need set free from whatever it is that's got us bound that's keeping us from serving God the way He wants us to serve Him Amen. and love Him and have a relationship with Him. Some of us needs to be set free and redeemed from the flat tires that's keeping us from going where God is asking us to go. Amen. Yes. How many? Look. Amen. I actually seen this not long, but not long ago. It's a car driving down the road, two flat tires. Honey, it wasn't stopping them. They was driving on the rim. 
Both rims, two rims, passenger side, sparking. Man, that spark's flying. I spread the car's pistol, catch on fire. They didn't care. They was getting where they was going. Yep. That was some determination. Amen. Some of us have got some flat tires, and we ain't even got roadside assistance. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting on the side of the road, and we're calling everybody. And instead of asking for help or trying to get help or trying to fix the problem, <coughs> Well, I was just calling to let you know I got a flat tire. You call the next person. My back tire's flat. You call the next person. I ran over a nail, my tire's flat. You call the next person. And you sit there with that flat tire. That thing that's keeping you from going to that next level. That thing that's keeping you from being where God wants you to be. Instead of getting yourself up, and figuring out how to change a flat tire or calling somebody and saying, Pastor Amy, my tire's flat and I do not even know how to change this tire, but I've got to get this tire flat because i got to get where God needs me to be. Amen. Amen. Now, y'all know I ain't talking about a physical flat tire. Yep. So let me break this down. Some of us sit around and we've got a problem and we want to call somebody about this problem. Well, it just don't seem to go away. Every day I wake up and this problem is just still here. And then you call the next person. Oh my God. This morning it's bothering me again. This problem just won't go away. It's a thorn in my flesh. It just won't go away. It's just still bothering me. And the next day, and the next person, 12 people the same day, you're calling about that same problem. Yep. And it's keeping you from going where God wants you to go. Instead of getting up and calling somebody and figuring out how to fix that problem, even if it's saying, you know what? I'm going to swallow my pride and I'm going to call Pastor or I'm going to call Cass or I'm going to call Gail or I'm going to call Chris or I'm going to call Abby and I'm going to swallow my pride and I'm going to say, I've got a problem and I need help. How Amen. do I get through this problem in my life? Amen. And change your tire and get back on the road. Yes. And start Amen. moving. Mm -hmm. Because we need a redeemer. Yes, and God do. knows we need a redeemer. Amen. And you know what, Chris? He sent us a redeemer 2,023 years ago. Amen. In a manger like that right there. Probably not that pretty. And a lot bigger. But similar. Mm. 2,023 years ago, Feed <coughs> he sent us a Redeemer in an ordinary way, in an ordinary life. So every day, in your ordinary way, mm. in your ordinary life, you can have access to him. Amen. And he can deliver you and set you free from whatever it is that you are going through. Yes. Amen. Because he's qualified. Yes. Now, God's done his part. Jesus has done his part. The Holy Spirit is trying and he's ready to do his part. Amen. But guess what? Now we have to do our part. Yes. Amen. Are we ready to sell? You have to sell to the Redeemer. You ready to go back to the pawn shop and get your 12 gauge back? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to let them sell it to somebody else? Now it's our turn. We have to make the decision. Some of us have lived so long in life we don't think that there's, there's change. Mm. I'm 43. Some of you may not think that's old. But when you've lived 43 years, you don't know any different. So to me, that's old. Yep. Right? I don't know any older. So I've got ways about me that it's hard to change. Because I don't know any different. Yep. And so to think that I could do something different to me is a challenge. I may not think that there could be anything different. 
I may not think that there could be a different way. I feel this way and I've felt this way my whole life. It doesn't mean that you've got to feel that way you're the rest of your life. Amen. How do you know that? Because the Bible says you don't. I don't know that. The Bible says you don't. So therefore I know. Right? Amen. we got to sell ourselves out. You've got to give the Redeemer an opportunity to make the difference. How did Naomi and Ruth know that when Boaz redeemed them, that it was going to be a good life. How did they know? Faith. Faith. Amen. And you know what the key to faith is? The Bible says faith without works is dead. Yes. You can believe all you want, but if you don't do your part, yep. if you don't do your part, mm. it's dead. Right. You can believe all you want, but if you don't take that step, it's not going to do any good. Yes. Am I right, Rhonda? Absolutely. Amen. You've got to take that step. I don't know how to take this step. The first step is to take a step. Yep. Mm -hmm. When my wife took kids to church, she just flat told me, I don't know what I'm doing, so this is what she done. Like the swan died, honey. Mm -hmm. Straight up in that thing. This is what she told me. Don't you let nobody in here because I don't know what I'm doing. I'll tell you when I'm ready for somebody to be in here. <laughs> How many of you know she's done a remarkable job so far? Yep. God is blessed. Because when you step out on faith, he will take care of the rest. When Peter stepped out of that boat, guess what? That water never moved. Sometimes you got to step out. Yes. God's done his part. Jesus has done his part. The Holy Spirit is ready to do his part. He's waiting on us to do our part. Let's stand to our feet this morning. <coughs> Gail, baby, if you can't, that's okay. Oh. Oh. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the birth of your son. Yes. Because if it wasn't for the birth of that baby, if it wasn't for that bloodline, if it wasn't for that 14 plus generation that came from Ruth and Boaz that Jesus came from, if it wasn't for that kinsman redeemer, Lord, we wouldn't have redemption. We would be at a dead end place. We would be lost. We would be undone. We would not have hope. But God, because, Lord, because of the birth of that baby, your son, Jesus, Emmanuel, you have made all things possible. This morning we want to say thank you for that. Father, I know there's people in this audience and I know that there's people listening online that as I've spoke the word this morning, it's penetrated hearts. Minds have been thinking of things in their life that they've been under bondage and they need set free from. And Father, I pray that we do our part and we step out and that we cry out to you and we say, Father, I need your son. I need to be redeemed. I need a redeemer today in my life. And I surrender to you. Father, let today be the day of salvation. Let today be the day that the shackles fall. Let the day be today when the mind is set free, when the body is healed. Let today be the day. What a great day. Christmas gift and to receive the Redeemer and to receive the freedom from the bondage that has been placed on lives for many years. Father, I ask you to move and to touch lives. Don't let your word go forth void. Father, I know you spoke this into my spirit. And God, I know that there's a person out there, and it may just be one, but I know that there's at least one person out there that needed to hear this word this morning. And I pray.
pray that it moves hearts and it changes lives and it brings people to the saving knowledge of your son Jesus Christ and I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus Amen Amen Amen